so okay hi everybody uh, i am tommaso cucinotta uh, from the real time systems laboratory of scuola superiore sant'anna in pisa italy and i'm going to talk to you about multi criteria optimization and the runtime architecture of ampere which uh, basically uh, follows on uh, basically what has been already introduced partially by my the other uh, ampere partners so um the uh, uh, the, the major uh, Ampere uh, ecosystem workflow has been already uh, sketched out by, by others in this uh, webinar. And basically we are focusing on this part here, which is highlighted on the top right corner, which is the, the multi-criteria optimization. Uh, so how we do it in the, to optimize the system for the various uh, multitude of criteria we have. So performance, heterogeneity, and predictability, energy efficiency, resiliency. Fundamentally, we deal with uh, a software model, okay, that is uh, uh, based on directed ACK graphs, which have real-time constraints. So the idea is that our set of applications, so we, we have a multitude of applications where each one of these applications can be modeled as a directed acyclic graph as in this picture, where we know what are the resource consumptions of each of these uh, computational nodes, and we know what are the, uh, the communication requirements across different communicational nodes, and we also know what is the end-to-end -end deadline to be respected by, by this computational graph on the, on the platform. Also, uh, what is important to understand is that here we have a lot of heterogeneity. So also connecting with the, the question for one of the attendees about DDFS, considering that our platform can, can be configured by using different, um, different uh, DDFS settings for the CPU, but also, the, also different DDFS settings, for example, for the GPU accelerator, uh, it is important that we have a precise uh, capturing of the uh, resource requirements, so fundamentally the execution times of, of our uh, tasks uh, in uh, all the possible conditions. Okay, so this can be uh, basically done by profiling uh, the tasks, and we have a tool chain in Ampere that uh, automates this profiling of the various uh, tasks and runables at different uh, frequencies, for example. Uh, and uh, partially, this can also be done by model based in case one does want to, to profile every single point, but we, we want to use like a sampling and then apply a model, simple scaling model. Uh, so uh, the, the hardware model uh, basically has the VFS capabilities for the CPU, has uh, also uh, one further information that we need to to know uh, for estimating the power consumption is the average execution time because we we can um, optimize in our workflow the average power consumption on the system uh, and to compute that we need to know what is the average execution time of our uh, of our uh, runables uh, also uh, other information we need is the power consumption of all the processing units of the processing elements on the platform so if we have cpus we need to know what is the power consumption when it is busy consuming processing or when it is idle and also for each uh, possible frequencies uh, and the same goes for the gpu for example or even for fpg accelerator in case we, we are on a board with fpg acceleration we need to know also the power consumption and the execution times of the hardware IPs of the accelerator. Uh, in, uh, in our optimization framework, we consider a number of fundamentally a, diff a, a heterogeneous number of schedulers uh, in the end, because we can have real-time tasks that are deployed on the CPUs uh, under preemptible partition DDF scheduling, at which we custom bandwidth server to implement employee and force temporal isolation across different tasks. Uh, which is done in the, in the our experimental uh, setup using SCAD deadline on Linux. Uh, so for this to be applied, we need to know the runtime and the end of the our processing elements. As we know, this comes from profiling, worst case execution, uh, etc. Worst case estimation, and uh, the uh, the deadline of these individual tasks is something you can see in this picture. Is the deadline of execution this DI here? This can be left as a variable so that our end-to-end -end optimizer can actually find the optimal values. So we can start from a specific, for a statically specified end-to-end -end deadline that comes from uh, the use case, from the timing requirements of the whole end-to-end -end application, 
and then we can uh, actually compute what are the best uh, intermediate deadline parameters to assign to our tasks. Um, also, uh, for uh, considering uh, OpenMP tasks that are deployed using the parallelization framework OpenMP uh, in, our, in our project, uh, these are assumed to be, uh, of course, non-preemptive tasks that are uh, so non-preemptive uh, FIFO tasks in the sense that in the OpenMP runtime worker threads, they have to run to completion. But then the worker threads itself of OpenMP can actually be scheduled uh, again under partition in the F and the constant bandwidth server. Uh, this allows us fundamentally to uh, deploy multiple OpenMP runtimes that are uh, that are sharing the same platform, but with, the, uh, with precise temporal isolation uh, across them. Uh, finally, for uh, accelerators, we uh, assume a non preemptive FIFO scheduler that is uh, available for uh, our FED framework for FPG acceleration, uh, but to a limited extent is also uh, usable for GPUs. Uh, overall, we can model our uh, uh, optimization system as a mixed integer quadratic constraint programming problem, uh, which I'm not going to explain in detail. But the important thing is that we have a number of topology constraints. We have a number of constraints dealing with the end-to-end -end deadline. Uh, and then we have the objectives, which can be specified in two ways, either as minimizing the power consumption, the average power consumption of the system, or it can be specified as maximize the minimum relative slack across the deployed end-to-end -end deadlines, end-to-end DACs. Um, and we will see how to use this in a moment. Uh, and then we have additional constraints uh, due to the max uh, utilization of each tag on each CPU, and so this will ensure our schedulability constraints. Uh, so what are the output of this optimization procedure? As output, what we obtain uh, is the optimum task to CPU mapping. So we know each task where it has to be mapped on what CPU so that it can be statically configured. Uh, we, we have the CPU island, the VFS configuration, and actually also the GPU configurations uh, if, if you have also a scalable frequency for GPUs. We can, so the optimizer can, can configure what is the, the one to be used for, for all the VFS islands and, and uh, including GPUs. Uh, we can uh, choose whether we want software variants or accelerated variants of uh, some of the tasks. So in this, in this DAX, we may have uh, some of these bubbles that can actually either be deployed on CPUs with some given execution times, so or it can be deployed on GPUs with some different execution time and associated power consumption, of course. So we can have all these uh, choices be fixed by our end-to-end uh, -end optimizer. And uh, yeah, and as I said also earlier, the optimum intermediate deadlines are computed and are useful because for software tasks, they go driving the, the SCAD deadline, the configuration of the SCAD deadline scheduling parameters of the various real-time threads. Uh, basically, we can compare experimentally this approach, this optimization approach with the baseline uh, uh, technique, uh, which is fundamentally performing first an end-to-end -end deadline splitting and then applying a MILP that is actually uh, collapsing into a Boolean linear programming uh, optimization program. Uh, so this is useful because uh, uh, once you fix the end-to-end -end deadlines, the problem reduces in complexity. We, it is no more quadratic and we can, uh, we can compute solutions faster, uh, albeit we lost optimality. So we can compute sub, sub, suboptimal solutions uh, this way at uh, reduced uh, complexity. Also, we developed a number of heuristics to deal with this uh, MIQCP problem, uh, but I'm, I'm not talking about them for the sake of time. So this is a few uh, uh, evaluations or a few uh, experiments we did to evaluate uh, the approach, the, optimi the optimizer, where you can see in this plot on the x-axis the optimum power consumption obtained uh, on a problem that was configured to minimize the power consumption. Uh, and on the y-axis, you have the, the optimization time, so how long it takes to perform this optimization. And uh, we have here uh, 1,700 randomly generated real-time duct sets with different characteristics. So with uh, more tasks or fewer tasks, with more ducts or fewer ducts. And uh, here you can see that there's a big heterogeneity of situations. So you may have uh, real-time ducts uh, sets 
they get optimized in a few seconds or a fraction of a second, and others they get optimized in a very high time, I mean, reaching up to even hours or beyond. And uh, our uh, mixed integer quadratic constraint programming provides us with the optimum solution. So it's the set of green dots where each dot here is an optimized scenario. Uh, so as you can see, uh, these green dots are generally uh, having a higher execution times than the, the baseline approach. But the baseline approach in the end is uh, extending towards more power consumption. So it, it's in the end, it finds solutions that on average will consume more power than the, the optimal one found by the uh, by the full approach. Also, you can see here some density of points highlighting that at some point we had to specify a timeout for this solver to run. So we had two sets of scenarios for some of these uh, 1700 uh, scenarios. We put a timeout to one hour and it's pretty visible here. These are solutions for which we don't have the exact optimum, but we have the optimum uh, the, the best solution after one hour. And here there was 24 hours, so the, the, there's a second density of points. Uh, on the right picture, you can also see how this performed on depending on the system load. So if I categorize these the same uh, scenarios uh, by system load, and then I can see that fundamentally the, the optimum solution in the end up achieves uh, on average uh, better power consumption. So we have a, a, a a lower power consumption than what can be done by by splitting and uh, deadlines end to end up front. Uh, and this is instead, so this was, let's say, the optimization. This is a real execution on, on one of the platforms we have uh, in Ampere. So in this case, we got we, we took a number of these uh, configurations and we have uh, precisely here uh, 19 configurations that have been picked up and run, so deployed on the platform with the optimum configuration that was configured by our uh, MIQCT QCT optimizer. Uh, and uh, they've been deployed on the platform by displaying here on this on this plot, you can see on the X axis, the scenario on the Y axis, we have the response time relative to the end-to-end -end deadline of the DAC. So if we stay below one, basically it means we, we are respecting deadline. If we are beyond one, it means we violated deadline. So what I'm showing here are segments because we repeated execution of each scenario a number of times, uh, registering what are the minimum uh, exhibited response time and the uh, maximum response time. So what we can see is that in most of these scenarios, we, we, we respected the end-to-end -end deadline, sometimes really it's really close to one, the end-to-end -end response times. Uh, and in some cases, we got, unfortunately, a few deadline violations. So this can be uh, due, uh, and it was due to fundamentally some worst case est uh, estimations that are, are done experimentally in this, in this experimentation. Uh, so uh, they are empirically uh, observed. So it can happen that during the, the runtime execution, we might have some unforeseen events that is not modeled, that unforeseen uh, interrupt, for example, that is in the end, uh, leading our scenarios to, uh, you know, higher execution times does in the end, we, we end up by viol violating that. Like, however, what we can do is to also use a second mode for our optimizer, which is uh, given the power consumption to optimize the scenario for, uh, re for uh, maximizing the relative slack. And this is the green curves in this plot. So the green curves are the same scenarios with optimized relative slack. And what happened is that repeating the same experiment in the end, we have on average uh, maximizing the relative slack. We have the same power consumption, but a better behavior in terms of how, how far I stay from the from missing deadlines. Uh, okay. So this is uh, roughly uh, an experimentation. Also, uh, going on a real uh, use case that we have in this uh, project, so on the, for example, on the Bosch use case, uh, on the automotive use case from Bosch, uh, this is showing the, a, a component of this use case that was uh, optimized. Uh, so basically, we took the, 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 the values from the monitoring and analysis tools that Miguel was presenting earlier. We applied the transformation engine that also Sergio was presenting from ETH, was presenting for uh, estimating power consumption uh, of, the, of the various components. And we use this information uh, to feed our optimizer so that we could run an optimization of the component. 
So after the optimization, we obtained the placement that we shown in this figure, where we can observe that we got everything placed on process units only, so only on CPUs. Uh, the GPU here was not chosen because it was leading, given the data we had, it was leading to higher power consumption in this case. But also we obtained a solution that had nearly zero slack. So was uh, also another solution borderline, let's say on the edge of uh, let's say was respecting the deadlines, but you know was not very robust. So what we tried to do is to run our optimizer by this time by maximizing the slack, but also giving a little bit of flexibility in terms of power. Instead of taking the the minimum power, we re-optimize by allowing a plus five percent power increase uh, over the minimum that was achieved for. So in this case, we got uh, uh, a the GPU chosen to maximize the select and we got uh, some some tasks deployed actually on the GPU as it's visible on this on this plot. So we, we have a, a, a more robust uh, uh, setup deployment scenario uh, by with a very little power increase that in the end gives us more select, which normally means more robustness at one time. Okay, so uh, considering the runtime, I can close by mentioning the, the reference runtime architecture we have in Ampere that includes a runtime uh, hypervisor uh, on, the, on the bottom. This is used on not on all the boards, but it can be used like on the Xilinx Ultra Scale Plus reference board where we have an FPGA acceleration fabric. Uh, and uh, of course, the, uh, yeah, on top of PipeOS, we can have two major let's say the important partitions are a hard real time partition that can host a hard real time OS like uh, Erica. Uh, and uh, uh, on the other side, we can have a soft real time partition hosting Linux uh, and the more complex uh, component libraries doing also uh, image processing or video processing in real time uh, and a lot of things that can be done on Linux. Uh, the two domains can communicate using uh, the DDS and uh, ROS. Uh, actually, it's micro ROS on the, the Erica side and uh, uh, DDS and the ROS2 on the Linux side. And also on the Linux side, we have deployed uh, OpenMP uh, with the OpenMP runtime that is actually helping applications to uh, that have been compiled with OpenMP to exploit parallelism in the hardware, but also to exploit uh, offloading hardware, hardware offloading to the GPUs, uh, uh, for example. And uh, uh, yeah, this OpenMP runtime has also been modified in the project uh, by uh, adding feature for resiliency and hardware offloading. So for, um, for dealing with the resiliency features. So, and, and uh, there was the, the, the presentation made previously by Eduardo and Sara. Uh, okay, so uh, last words is that uh, in the runtime, still on this type of board, what we are using uh, for, ac for accelerating our uh, functions on uh, FPGAs is a framework called uh, FRED, which is uh, a, two, a framework we, we brought forward as well as Antana for the building, let's say, a predictable execution of hardware IP accelerators uh, on FPGA slots. And this is available as open source, as an open source tool also uh, outside of the project. And it is basically designed so that you can fundamentally have a time schedule of uh, hardware accelerators on the same uh, FPGA slots. Uh, by, uh, let's say, ensure the guaranteed respect of timelines and end-to-end -end deadline constraints. So we, there's a full set of tools around this framework that allows us to uh, analyze the system and optimize the system in a way that we know upfront that whenever we, we're going to have like one, one task using the FPGA, uh, an FPGA slot, then we know what is the, the, the execution time. But if we have multiple tasks having to swap the, the FPGA uh, contents, uh, the slot contents uh, at one time, we, we also have a nice modeling of this additional content switch time on the FPGA slot. And this, these all things is, has been considered in this framework and it's also, uh, is also considered in our optimization framework. Uh, okay, so I think I said pretty much everything. So this is, I think I can skip. I, I had uh, just a few further numbers that, okay, what happens with FPGA acceleration 
uh, when we are running this uh, uh, under, uh, you know, in our overall runtime stack that is including also a hypervisor, PyCoS. So we, we got a few numbers here of uh, how much it takes, for example, to make a, a call using the FED framework to the, to the uh, to the FPGA hardware uh, acceleration. And we, we can see here that we have uh, simple examples. Fundamentally, we are paying 150 microseconds of overheads uh, if we are not reconfiguring the, the hardware IP. And we are paying uh, 200, roughly 190 microseconds uh, of overheads if we are instead of reconfiguring the hardware IPs. So this is due to the fact that with within Fed, we, yeah, we, we we need additional time to reconfigure to to invoke also additional components on the board, including a, uh, a kernel thread that handles the reconfiguration of the uh, hardware device. Uh, but okay, so I guess this comes to an end uh, of my presentation. I see there is. Uh, Thomas, uh, there is a question here for you. Um... Okay. So how does the number of nodes in your randomly generated uh, DAGs compare to the number of nodes in the actual use cases? Yeah, very good question. So in our, uh, in, our uh, in the one that I showed earlier, we have fundamentally uh, a component that we have in the overall end-to-end -end DAG that was optimized uh, that in the end was uh, one of the most interesting in a sense, because it was having uh, a lot of things, nodes and interactions and interconnections. Uh, the overall uh, use case was uh, including additional stuff. So uh, we didn't make, uh, let's say a complete, fully, uh, full optimization of the, of the, uh, the overall uh, uh, software of the overall, let's say, uh, use case model uh, simply uh, because we, for the moment, we didn't have time to profile exactly also all those other components. But let's say this, that is handable by the same tool chain that we have. So if we if we take the overall tool chain, we can re optimize this the the overall uh, set of tags. Yes, okay, so the second question is about the scalability of the approach. So uh, the scalability is, uh, of course, is touching fundamentally on this point you can see here. So uh, whenever we have, a, let's say, uh, use cases that, uh, let's say, scenarios, optimization scenarios that have relatively a few nodes, we can, we have, let's say, affordable execution times. Uh, if we if we want more complex scenarios, we may get like we may start approaching this a problem of scalability. Uh, and the, in the scenarios we optimized so far, uh, we took only a few minutes to optimize the the, the example I was showing earlier, this one. Uh, but uh, for example, in our randomly generated task sets, as I was saying earlier, we have scenarios that even reach up to 24 hours of optimization without giving us uh, yet the optimal solution. Uh, so um, this can be very variable depending on the scenario, but in, in case you, you cannot afford waiting so long, what we have in the end is either the, the second uh, approach here or even additional heuristics, which as I said, I didn't, I didn't uh, have time here to describe. So we have additional heuristics that are, uh, yeah, much more scalable, but of course there you, you lose in optimality. You, you can find that on a paper we published uh, uh, recently on ACM transactional embedded computing systems. Okay, great. Looks like that was responded. So thank you, Tommaso. And, uh... Okay. So I guess now it's time to dig a bit deeper into this one time with Claudio. Yes, I have one. Hope you see the slides. So yes, the, um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the software framework uh, that uh, we have been using uh, on top of the hardware. So uh, I'm going to give you some details about the hypervisor and the operating system. Uh, the problem has been already defined, uh, um, the fact that, uh, especially in automotive, uh, we need to uh, integrate several um, different functionalities inside the same, the same uh, ECU. 
and uh, well, automotive is uh, moving towards uh, the zonal computing framework in which you are expected to run functionalities with uh, very different uh, um, uh, non-functional requirements on top of the same hardware. So the idea was to tackle this challenge by integrating uh, functionalities with different levels of criticality, creating a mixed criticality uh, platform uh, that has been already uh, partially mentioned. So um, as a reference uh, hardware, we took the Xilinx uh, platform uh, because it contains uh, a very different kind of processing units like uh, the Cortex-A for running uh, uh, operating systems like Linux, but also Cortex-R, um, real-time cores for running um, a safety, uh, safety critical applications, and there is also the FPGA as it was already mentioned. Uh, we uh, we put on top of the of the platform a, a hypervisor, namely PyCoS by partner Cisco, and uh, to have uh, to import, uh, to force safety through uh, partitioning and isolation of resources, and then we installed Linux to have uh, performance reliability. It's a POSIX OS, so it can be used uh, for both ROS and autos are adaptive, as it was already mentioned. Here, I just mentioned that we also installed the, the parameter T patch uh, by the Linux kernel community, which allowed it to uh, drop the worst case latency uh, to about 1% of the original value that was measured. So a quite significant uh, uh, result uh, by using this, uh, this uh, real-time patch. And then uh, we created an, an additional domain um, consisting of an AutoSAR classic stack based on an operating system like uh, called Eric Enterprise that is going to be um, uh, explained and illustrated uh, later on by Paolo Guy. And uh, just know that it's a minimal uh, RTOS as, uh, as specified by the Autosar Classic uh, specification. And uh, it, it's designed according to the Autosar and the OSIC uh, uh, APIs. And it's been also qualified ISO 262662 ACLD. Um, the communication, as Tommaso uh, was mentioning, uh, has been based on micro ROS and ROS. So we had ROS for the communication between tasks inside Linux and micro ROS for the communication with, uh, with the AutoSAR Classic uh, stack. Additionally, we also um, synthesized a RISC V um, soft core on the FPGA. Uh, we selected uh, the, uh, the soft core, uh, also known as Harian. And, um, and uh, we uh, implemented uh, the micro ROS communication between Linux on the Cortex A and, uh, and uh, Erica running on the soft core uh, RISC V. And finally, um, we, we have implemented model based design uh, engineering by letting Amalthea, which has been already uh, described. Uh, to generate uh, through the synthetic load generator code for OpenMP, of course, running uh, Linux, but also the, the communication uh, code uh, based on ROS or micro ROS uh, for, for, the, for the two different domains. Why we also consider risk five in the project? Uh, because uh, the trends uh, show that uh, it's uh, the piece of uh, of, uh, of uh, adoption of this uh, this technology is quite fast, and also uh, a large adoption is expected to to happen also in the in the transportation domain. Um, let me mention that uh, we just published a paper uh, which is already available on the IEEE um, uh, website. 
related to the to the activity that we did in project uh, to optimize uh, the the RTOS for the risk 5 and also optimize the risk 5 technology uh, to 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 have to show better performance uh, this work has been done by partner uh, ETH Zurich, uh, which added uh, um, a core local interrupt controller to the hardware to improve uh, the, the predictability of the system. So I won't take much time. I just give you the, the, the pointer uh, because uh, the paper is, uh, is, uh, is very detailed. And finally, uh, let me let me tell you that um, we have uh, taken uh, the predictive uh, cruise control use case made by Bosch, and uh, we we ported this model uh, generated from Amaltia inside our platform. So we had every car running a set of uh, of, uh, of uh, periodic tasks and. Uh, other tasks were executed on Linux, and we had the, the full, uh, full chain of, uh, of execution uh, generated from Amaltria and run inside, uh, inside the platform. Um, we also had a full video showing this, uh, this uh, communication happening and the use case running on the two operating systems, but for the sake of time, uh, I won't. I won't show it uh, now. So this concludes uh, an overview of the framework and uh, I will now uh, leave the floor to Paolo Gai that will tell you some, some further information about uh, the Erika uh, real-time operating system. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio.